with the reality that the works of God are very large. We are part of that work. In our very being in the earth, He's created us. He hung the world on nothing. And He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, governing the nations. Things revealed to our brother Daniel about the moving of the governments of men from one generation to another, from one people to another, all of this was under the jurisdiction of heaven in order to fulfill his purpose, moving human history to its appointment with his will and his chosen one who was coming into the earth. That's a very large endeavor. From creation, he did those things. And then he destroyed all life, everything that breathed by the great flood, opening the deeps, opening the skies, everything that breathed died. That was a very large task. Then he replenished the earth from eight souls, four men, four women, the earth was replenished. And then the descendants of those eight souls, when their pride welled up in them, God confused and scattered their language in their thinking, scattered them physically then because they could not communicate with one another. That was not a small thing. When you think about the clamor of some to join all the nations together, and we even have an institution called the United Nations, huh? the walls of whose headquarters are inscribed with the word of God, whom they do not acknowledge, not truly. He had in mind to bless all the nations by making a nation from one man and one woman both beyond the age of childbearing, when he made the promise. And then, of course, waited 25 more years to fulfill the promise so that there would be no doubt that this was the hand of God. That's a very large thing. He brought then an enslaved nation out of the midst of the most politically, economically, and socially, and militarily powerful nation on the face of the earth. Just plucked them out. Not, not only that, that nation pleaded with them to leave and paid them wages to leave. <laughs> After God put them in a position to no longer want those people among them. Very large thing. There was no rebellion. There was no revolution. There was no insurgency. God did this. He chose the time. He chose the method. He chose the people. And extended his hand into human history doing these things. Very large thing. And then, of course, he brought that nation through a trackless wasteland with very little sustenance for them and provided for them. Their sandals did not even wear out. There's no proof of this, is there? <laughs> this very large thing? There's no physical evidence of such a thing at all. The Word of God reveals this very large endeavor to us. And the list goes on and on and on and on, taking land from seven strong nations and giving it to this one little nation whom he had been sustaining for a whole generation in the wilderness. Just took it from them and gave it to them keeping, establishing and maintaining a holy people in a corrupt and vile and fleshly and worldly environment around them while developing within them a holy and godly environment in their thinking and in their understanding. He, he did this. He did this. 
He made a boy a king right under the nose of a corrupt and um, a corrupt king who, who was failing in his faith. He had once had faith, but it failed in his own pride. And right in his own house, he raised up another king from a boy. Not a small thing. Then he preserved a remnant of faith in a religiously callous nation, that same nation, of course, who had become hard-hearted, stiff-necked for generation after generation after generation, but he had a people. He had a remnant in that nation, didn't he? That he kept for himself, that he could work in until the time was ready, until the fullness of time, the Scripture tells us. He did that. Then he sent someone from his very presence. Personal representative. Why his own son. Who appeared to be just one of them. One of that nation. Appeared to be just one of them. Walking among them. Going about doing good and healing those who are oppressed of the devil. That was a large thing. Not a small thing at all. To entrust the power that he did to Jesus of Nazareth. And for Jesus of Nazareth to be faithful in handling that power. We talked about that this morning. Earlier today. Faithful in handling that power. And not, not losing control. Or losing his bearings as we say. About what was really happening. What really needed to be done. And how he would handle that how he would handle all things that had been handed over to him by his father. Again, that was not a small thing. Through a remnant of faithful people, then, he would testify of the truth to a truthless generation. Those who were not interested. But he raised up a people who were willing in the day of his power he raised them. He regenerated a dead people. He did this, extending his own hand into the earth, turning the world upside down by a message of good news through a small assembly of godly people, and brought forth that testimony from the word from the mouths of the pagans who rejected the message. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has welcomed them. Not a small thing. And preserving faith in the hearts of generations. That's what he's doing right now. Generation after generation after generation, he has worked to preserve faith until the last day in the midst of a hostile environment. Hostile in the people themselves. And hostile around them. But he's doing that work now making the enemies of his son a footstool for his feet until the last day. Not a small thing. These are large enterprises about which our text is speaking, of course. It does from a broad perspective. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be a servant, the power of the Most High overshadowed Mary. And formed him from the womb. To be his servant. And we all know that from a very young age he knew. I have to be about my father's business. And yet he submitted himself to his parents. Went back to Nazareth with them. Prepared himself until the time was ready. Giving, simply giving a testimony at that key moment in his life. Giving a testimony... That he was on a mission. He had a commission from heaven to which he was devoted to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, my God shall be my strength. It was a monumental task consider considering uh, the condition and the callousness of the hearts of the people that Jesus had to deal with. Shallow and empty. 
most, most all of them, uninterested. Until, of course, he came and acted and spoke, and that woke some people up, didn't it? And he went about choosing certain ones who were tender, certain ones in key places. Now, they were not, we know they were not the ones that anyone would expect. They were unlearned, uneducated men, weren't they? And everyone recognized that. Everyone knew that they were not part of the accepted religious elite. And, of course, they said of, this le of their leader, where did this man get this wisdom, having never learned? He doesn't have our seal of approval. He did not get these things from us. They knew that, didn't they? Their hearts were not producing what he was saying. Their education system, scriptural, biblical education system, was not producing what he was saying. This was something new. This was something completely unusual and original. And it did not fit their template, did it? They knew that. This was something completely new. And of course, he told them that parable. You don't put new wine into old wineskins. Or they'll burst. You don't put new cloth on an old garment. Or it will shrink and tear. Something new had to be done. So God had designed for this to be. To bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him. Because God had made promises to them. He had taken them to himself and made them his people. You all are familiar with the account there in Ezekiel 16, aren't we? Brother Ricky mentioned this part of that text this morning. Wallowing in our blood. Or wallowing in their blood alongside the road. And God came along and saw them and said, Live. So he made them what they were. And they knew that. They knew that. But the human heart is so calloused. And even in the revelation that God had given them, there was no power to redeem the heart. There was no power to transform, which, which needed to be done. There are still many, of course, within the environs of religion, however you want to define that, who don't understand the nature of these things and that there must be a new creation. They still don't understand that. They still think that, and, and many of us thought that at one time. Many of us did, didn't we? Me, well, meaningly, we thought that. And pardon my grammar there. We thought that with good intentions. That if we just follow a, B, C, D, E, right on down the line. If we just do all of these things properly, following the pattern, the revealed pattern, we'd, we'd get it right. And God would be pleased with us. We thought that at one time. Amen. There are many who do. Of course, they're all over the place with the pattern. It goes every direction. It is a hodgepodge, if you want to say it that way. Everywhere. When Revelation clearly tells us, from the prophets even, there must be something new. You must be made new. And of course, the teacher of Israel who came asking the rabbi from Galilee heard, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. How can these things be? And you say, you're a teacher of Israel and don't understand these things. Moses and the prophets and the Psalms had testified of these things, and yet he did not understand. Hard hearts had produced someone who, who had interest and came seeking. And when he was plainly, when he was told these things plainly, there was, there was, a, there was a, a wall blocking things, a, hard, a hardness could not see. He was, he was hemmed in, hemmed in by the empty traditions that had been handed down to him from the fathers. Generations before, 
The writer and judges had said in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Then centuries later, after David and Solomon, the prophet Isaiah says, From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence, and it is devastated, is overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. But God was faithful, see. Amen. He intended to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him. And so he sent one who was glorious in his eyes. This one who was accepted and approved. God kept his word for his own namesake, not because of them, but because of his word, because of his promises to the fathers, as Brother mentioned in our lesson the other evening, for the sake of Abraham, for the sake of the fathers, yeah. he did this. For the promises that he had made to them, he would bring them back. He would restore them. He attempted to gather them again and again and again from their wanderings, but they were a stiff-necked, stubborn, rebellious ones. At one point, they said, Do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things and prophesy deceits or delusions. Tell us stories. Now, there's, there's some of us who've had people tell us that still today. Tell us stories. Don't talk to us about these things. We don't know what you're talking about. Some of us have people say that to us in our own generation. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. One of the translations says, Speak no more to us of the Holy One of Israel. They didn't want to hear it. They wanted their prophets to talk to them about them. And there are many in the churches today still that way. They will be offended and say things like, but what does that mean to us? Because it doesn't mean anything to them. The pure word of God does not mean anything to them, and they're not interested in it meaning anything to them. That's why they say things like that. If they were interested, they wouldn't ask that question. They'd ask a right question. Uh -huh. Huh? That's right. Amen. In order to understand. Yeah. So you see, these things do mean something to those who have a heart for the truth. My God shall be my strength, says this one. And so the chosen one walked before them in righteousness and truth, and he displayed his glory. The glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. But there were not many who were interested in the grace and truth of God, his favor. And the reality of what he loved and what he hated, of what he treasured and what he despised, of what he was going to take to himself and what he was going to banish from his presence forever. They were not interested in that. They were interested in their place and their nation. And if we let this man go on like this, the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. We've got to stop him. What you're doing is not accomplishing anything. That's what they said, isn't it? As they argued with one another about how they were going to deal with this rebellious, disrespectful country preacher who had no one's seal of approval as far as they were concerned. They were not interested, of course, in God's seal, were they? They had their own seal, you see. They had the vineyard, and we're not going to pay the rent. And if he sends his son in here, we'll kill him and take the inheritance for ourselves. It belongs to us. Now, that was their view. They never would have said that so plainly. But that's precisely what they did, even when the son told them that. 
they could not resist. See, because their hearts, once you start going down that road so far, you can't turn back. And even, you remember they said, not during the feast, lest the people rebel. But they couldn't, could they? They had to do it during the feast because that was the time God had chosen. So even though they resisted, they had to demand that he be executed during that feast because that was God's appointed time. See, It was not their time. The prophet declares, I have stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts. He had warned them again and again and again three times in Leviticus 26. Three times in Leviticus 26, Moses had told them after and after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Heaven called to them again and again and again because God had compassion on his city and his temple and he sent his son and his son wept over Jerusalem and said, how often I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under his wing, but you were not willing. You don't know. Even as they talked about peace, he said, you don't know the things that make for peace. You don't know. So though they were unfaithful to their promise, God was faithful to his. And he had this remnant, a hidden remnant. Like, you remember the prophet Ezekiel was told to sow a little bit of your hair in the hem of your robe. Take it out and purge it again. Some in the fire, some thrown to the wind, but some keep. So there were ones who were kept. Zachariah and Elizabeth, Simeon and Anna, Mary and Joseph, countless others that we don't, you know, others that we don't know about, whom these had fellowship with. You remember Anna went out about and and spoke to many who were waiting for the salvation of Israel. And of course, when Zachariah and Elizabeth's son came preaching from the wilderness. All of Judea came out to hear him preach. And many turned. Many of the most godless turned. As he prepared a people for the Lord. Made ready and straight the way. Raising up the valleys and breaking down the mountains and hills. To make, our, um, to make the way straight for the Lord. And bring, and, and bring then Jacob back to him. So that Israel is gathered to him. And as the prophet had said, the truth would go out from Jerusalem. And it did. It went out from that place. For you see, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, are irrevocable. As you were once disobedient to God, he writes to Gentiles, yet now, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed all, has remitted them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. See, this, this is Paul's reasoning about how God is working to keep this promise to Abraham and to have, always have, a people of Israel before him, in his presence, in fellowship with him. The Savior was sent first of all to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. God's children first ate the bread of truth from his lips. They were led by streams of water into green pastures. They first, by this revelation, those who were cultured in God's truth and recognized it when they heard it. There were, there were many. When Paul went out into the synagogues in, in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, the synagogues in Berea, Thessalonica, and Corinth, there were many who responded immediately, didn't they? Yeah. 
Two of the leaders of the synagogues in Corinth were beaten by their own people. Now, one of them was beaten. One of them had already become a believer. Another man, who apparently we don't know the details, but Sosthenes, uh, wasn't a Sosthenes, was, that was beaten in front of the court because he'd been sympathetic to Paul. See, So there were some in the synagogues, not many, but there were some who gladly heard and believed. And, of course, it very soon, uh, very soon, the number of Gentiles outnumbered the Jewish, the ones who were prepared. Whom Paul, that monumental sermon there in Antioch of Pisidia, when they said, brothers, if you have a word of encouragement for the people, speak. Well, Paul had it, didn't he? <laughs> I've come to announce to you that from this man, David, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus of Nazareth. And he will justify you from everything from which the law of Moses could not justify you. Amen. And the people were, the whole city was stirred up. Mm -hmm. Even the Gentiles were stirred to come. The next Sabbath, the whole city showed up to hear this message of good news. And of course, some refused. But that did not deter the apostles from declaring these things. For God had a people. The word had become flesh, dwelt among them. Israel, they'd beheld his glory. And there were some like Paul and Barnabas and Silas. And of course the others who'd already been numbered together as believers. They were fearless and bold to declare this truth. Because of what they had seen. They could not, they could not help but speak the things that they had seen. They had to obey God rather than men. They had to do this. This was the people that God had cultured for himself. This was, this was Jacob that, that the son had brought back to the father and that Jesus had gathered Israel, that he had gathered to himself. This, this little assembly who took the word out went out from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. Boldly taking this message. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding and that we may know Him who is true and we are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Amen. The Apostle John Amen. declared. They knew these things. They'd handled them. They'd seen Him. And they wanted to declare these things. See. So that those who had believed would be strong and firm and unmoved in the things that they'd heard and the things that they'd believed. They heard him speak when he said, All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. They heard him speak when he said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. And that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught, taught me, I speak these things. They heard him say, I speak what I've seen with my Father, and you do what you have seen from your Father. When he spoke to his enemies. See. They heard him boldly, in their faces, tell them who they really were. Those who rejected him. Those who were his enemies. He turned many in Israel back to the Lord their God, saved them from their sin, turned them from their wicked ways, granted them faith, repentance, and understanding of God's ways as he worked to rebuild the tabernacle of David, which had fallen. I will rebuild its ruins. I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does these things. Now we go to the larger enterprise, huh? <laughs> it's a small thing to bring Israel back, in, by comparison. It was a hard thing. But it was only a small thing. For you see, God had the whole world in his sights, so to speak, didn't he? He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
Whosoever believeth on him should not perish. Whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yeah. He bore our sin, sins in his body on the tree, yeah. Peter said, to his audience, to his readers. All sin. All sin. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you, the psalm says. All the nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. The prophet Isaiah says, And now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him and his resting place shall be glorious. Amen. By the working of God's wisdom, he drew, the Father drew people to his Son. And the Son was not willing to cast them out those who came to him. He received them. Those who were drawn by his father. Hungry seekers. They expended their energy to come to him. The sick, the weary, the inquirers of truth came to Jesus daily. Daily they came. Until at last at the end, sitting in the temple teaching, there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And it was at that point that the Savior said, Now is the judgment of this world. When they came seeking, see, that was the time for him to declare this. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And that's what's happened. That's what the Father accomplished. The Son had already stated this principle of sowing and reaping. Now we know how many in the nominal church use that phrase. The law of sowing and reaping. Well this is the law of sowing and reaping. This is the real one. Not, not that surface one. Not that fundraising one. Not that salary paying one. Not that personal enrich the preacher one. This is the real one. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Truly, truly, or most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain or fruit. Now that's the true law of sowing and reaping. When the son laid down his life, when the son was planted in the earth and came forth again to life forevermore, the power of his indestructible life overflowed to the point that many devout men came out of the graves in Jerusalem and appeared to many in Jerusalem as a testimony of what would come when this truth was declared in the nations and they would come. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, up on them a light has shined. Apostle Paul cited that text. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, deep darkness of the people, but the Lord will arise over you. Remember Zechariah's words at his son's birth? The sunrise from on high has visited us. His glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your, raise, of your rising. These are only a few statements. There are numerous others that speak to this God drawing those who were not his people to him 
to become his people. And a larger benefit then, of course, would be to make Israel jealous. We've already spoken to that. The Apostle Paul declared that, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. For I speak to you, Gentiles, inasmuch as I am apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if by any means I may provide, or I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh, and save some of them. I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in, and so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins concerning the gospel they are enemies for your sake, but concerning election they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. So God is faithful in these things to bring his people. And, and, and you see, that faithfulness, we partake of that faithfulness, brethren. All of the promises of God in Christ Jesus. We partake of that faithfulness because he is working in us exceeding beyond what he worked in Israel. Those of us who have hoped in his son, who have fled to him for refuge, he's working in us far beyond that now. Having targeted these things to have a people for his own possession who are zealous for good deeds, who give themselves to works that he prepared in advance for them. To bear fruit to him. Fruit that will not fail. And that they will not fail. And the work of God in them will not fail. Because of the overflowing power of his son's life. Empowered by the spirit of the son. We go out doing this work. Putting our hand to the plow and not looking back. Because he is working in us from his Father's throne to will and do his Father's will, from the place of absolute power, all authority in heaven and on earth. He's working in us, and he will not fail. He will not fail in that work as we are faithful, as we look to him in faith, as we wait upon him in faith, as we give ourselves to him in faith. That faith will work in us. It's designed to do that. By its nature, it does that. It always has. That's what the Spirit's saying there in what we call Hebrews 11. To make them a people. To make us a people. In whom God can dwell and abide. For fellowship with the divine. To partake of his truth. To engage ourselves in his purpose making us then a holy people for I am holy and you shall be holy for us that's a promise you see it's not a commandment it's a promise that he is working in us for as the psalmist says truth shall spring up out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven yes the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase that's us brethren we're the land. We're yielding the increase because he's planted in us his own seed. So we are yielding after the same nature of that seed. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. And so we ever walk. We walk every day in that pathway. Letting him do that work. Removing ourselves from anything that entangles us removing any barriers or any hindrances by his power and by his working in us that the way should be clear that we could draw near and then walk in that way as the voice speaks behind us this is the way walk in it and we say yes Lord lead us lead us evermore thank you brother for your kind attention this evening